diversity is key. And so providing all sorts of different habitat types that will provide kind of the best benefit for many different species. And also interspersion, you have areas that are food plots mixed with soft edge and woods and pines. And so you've got corridors and different habitat types that wildlife can move through. So diversity can't be, I, I can't overstate that enough, that diversity is really key and that habitat management wildlife habitat management often doesn't look pretty it can be dirty farming and that but that's a good thing because again you want diversity lots of different habitats lots of different structure because you're looking to provide things like cover also forage and food um, so these are all the sorts of different things you have to talk about when it comes to wildlife and the other two things I really wanted to hit on are three things actually where Ward mentioned you see here what we call edge so he's got his food plot and then on either side of this food plot he's got what we term as soft edge. So a hard edge would be uh, essentially you've got a, a, a track of woods and you've just got mowed grass. You know, you've got an inch of grass on the ground. That's a really hard transition for a lot of small game. You know, you think about a rabbit coming out of the woods where it was in some decent cover and now it's hitting this, this open field and all sorts of predators, it's now vulnerable. So providing this soft edge, this transition really does make a difference for a lot of those smaller game. Um, and you can do that by either planting, you can, you have a field where you've got a food plot, you could decide that, all right, this, this is going to be my buffer zone, my soft edge, and you can plant something. You can disc the field and let succession happen, or you could cut into the woods by chance and, and allow succession to occur that way. Uh, lots of different options, but providing edge is, is really important for wildlife. And Ward mentioned prescribed burning. So historically and honestly not in our distant past fire was a very natural occurrence on our landscape um, mostly it was lightning ignited fires um, also probably native americans uh, so fire was something that happened all the time and, and fires often burned uncontrolled over large tracts of land and they weren't really extinguished until they met some sort of natural fire break like a river or maybe there was a large rainstorm and it put the fire out. And so because of that, because we have such a, a, a long history of fire, a lot of species co-evolved with fire and even some became dependent on it. And today, you know, we suppress wildfires for, for good reason, all right? We have a growing human population. There's a lot of development. We don't want wildfires burning down people's homes. As a result of that though, we've really suppressed fire and the habitats that fire produces and the species that require it or depend on it have since declined, which is unfortunate. So agencies like Department of Wildlife Resources, Forestry, we now use prescribed burning and landowners use this as well as a management tool to attempt to bring back that sort of disturbed landscape and then hopefully bringing with it the species that really depend on it. Things like bobwhite quail, red cockaded woodpeckers, if you've heard of the RCWs before. So fire is a really fantastic tool. It, fire prescribed burning, it sets back succession. So when we talk about succession, if you, if you clear cut land, you do any sort of disturbance on the land and you, you watch and see what comes back. You're gonna have stages of succession all the way up to a mature forest. And so when you prescribe burn, you're gonna set back succession. You're really gonna knock back any woody species and you're gonna allow early successional habitat to come forth. And that's another important term to know, early successional habitat, because that is also very important for wildlife. And it's a lot like what we're looking at here. This is a form of succession that's occurring. You know, it, it's weedy, it's beautiful, it's providing cover, it's providing forage. And if nothing is done with this edge here, you give it another three, five, ten years, and you'll start to see more hardwoods creep up in it and so on and so forth. So you maintain it where you want it to be, but fire can do that for you. Um, there's lots of different management tools. Uh, there's disking, there's mowing, uh, all sorts of different things that will disturb the land and allow you to set back succession and start over again. Um, your natural seed bank is sometimes an issue and Jason's going to talk about exotics, specifically this tree of heaven. You know, when you disturb the landscape, you're going to wait and see what comes back. And there's all sorts of seed in the, in our seed bank and you never know what you'll get. So it, you're always taking a risk that, Hey, Johnson grass, it seems to be an issue still here. And, and so wildlife habitat management, the work never ends. Ward will tell you that. 
Um, it, you're constantly doing something, uh, but it's re very rewarding in the end because you're producing what you want to see and it's benefiting the wildlife on your property. The other thing I wanted to mention, Jason asked, was um, pollinator habitat. And this is maybe something that you guys have heard a lot of uh, recently. Um, pollinators are amazing animals and creatures, and, and there can be all sorts of different pollinators. So we're talking birds, insects. Um, unfortunately, you've probably heard we're seeing a decline in pollinators, specifically native bees and the monarch butterfly. Um, those, those populations just aren't doing as well. And so pollinators really are, I consider them to be, uh, you know, a keystone species, which means they impact our ecosystem from the bottom up because they support almost all of our terrestrial plants, which are the basis of our food webs, and then therefore provide food for not only wildlife, but for us as humans. So pollinators are fantastic. And so when, when I'm talking to people or landowners that are interested in wildlife habitat management, I always try and, and, and add this to it, that pollinators are important. There are things you can do for pollinators. And this two specific things would be to plant pollinator habitat. And that can be in many different forms. Um, and, and sometimes, honestly, you might not even have to plant something. But typically for pollinators, you want uh, diverse shapes, sizes, and colors of flowers that ideally are growing throughout the growing season. So they've got a variety of things, nectar, to feed off of through the summer and into the fall. Um, and then avoiding any pesticide use as best you can because we've found that pesticides do do a number on a lot of uh, pollinators. Um, there are great resources, actually NRCS has a really awesome pollinator guide to, based on what region you live in in the country, there's a, there's a southeastern like mixed forest pollinator guide. It's got a list of all the native plants that are uh, native to your area that pollinators like. Um, so I encourage you to, if you're interested in pollinators, seek out resources, ask questions, because again, the more we can do for, for that group of species, I think the better, because we are seeing declines for sure. And I think the last thing I wanted to add was just that, again, getting back to this dirty, dirty farming, as we're calling it, um, it takes work, it takes a lot of investment, and you can't expect results right away. You know, a lot of times you, you, you imply these techniques on your property, whether it's fire or disking, you know, it takes time to produce the results that you ultimately want. So patience is key um, because these things don't happen overnight, uh, especially as succession occurs. I mean, that where you're talking years of time in which these things happen. So patience is key, but it does pay off. Some of the bigger operations that we have in the county and how many trees are actually shipped out of Grayson County from surrounding counties as far as a hub of the Christmas tree industry, I, I dare say that it's in the top five in the nation. Um, and it'll start in about two weeks, I'd say. About two weeks. Oh, yeah. And there will be somewhere between uh, uh, numbers of Christmas trees may be hard for you to relate to, so I'll put it in terms of how many tractor trailers. It'll probably be between uh, 1,000 and 1,200 tractor trailer loads of Christmas trees that will leave this uh, this area uh, starting in a couple weeks. So it is big business, multi-million dollar business. That's just the Christmas trees. But I'll touch on the, uh, the Christmas tree industry a little bit and and even some things uh, may not be something you've considered for your land uh, and that's that's all right uh, it's just another opportunity that's out here from the wholesale christmas tree side um that's what most of our industry is uh, built around right now uh, it's kind of interesting you have that much uh product moving out of the area and yet, uh, if some of you I wanted to go right now and cut a Christmas tree at uh, a choose and cut type facility uh, or farm, uh, there's hardly any of those. Uh, and I think there's a real opportunity where we're at. Um, 
for that kind of a, an establishment. You can do it on smaller acreage. You can do that with more organic type production practices if you choose to do that. So I think there's a real opportunity. And so I'll touch a little bit on that. Why Grayson County or our neighbors right here close? If you look at the species of Christmas trees, uh, it kind of started out, I think, with white pine. I used to remember a lot of white pine when I was a kid. They would be shaped, trimmed up, and that was a, a dominant species. Then you started seeing a lot more of the Fraser fir. And why Fraser fir? And a big part of that is the needle retention. People didn't like bringing something in their house. In a couple of weeks, all the needles fall off, making a big mess. Fraser fir has a, is very aromatic, but I think by and large, what makes it unique is that it's just superior in needle retention compared to like a, a blue spruce or some of the other species. Why else is Grayson important? Most of the Christmas trees, there's not so much here on the eastern part of Grayson County, but as you move west up into the higher elevations, you'll start to see a lot more. Most of those can trace their genetics back to the native Fraser fir strains in Mount Rogers and White Top. Okay. And uh, so if you're not from right here in this area, those are the two highest elevations, two highest peaks in Virginia. And they are a very unique microclimate up there uh, with, the, with the red spruce, which was used a lot in instrument making, and, and these Fraser firs. Um, they grow these as a uh, nursery stock um, in beds. Uh, more and more lately, they've actually started going to a greenhouse type production for the cedars. Um, and then they'll take those out to the field. They can grow those um, in a, typically in a five by five spacing out in the field. Uh, site selection is absolutely critical. Uh, one of the biggest issues with Fraser fir is they do not like wet areas. They get root diseases. So drainages, hollows, if you will, or if you're from here, hollers uh, <coughs> around ponds, creeks, those, those are not good places for Fraser fir. Four sites, on, and you'll see sometimes if you're in the western part of the county, you're like, how do they even plant these on something that's steep? Uh, but they really like well green land, um, slopes, so that's all right with them. Um, you know, uh, yeah, that site selection is critical for those root disease issues. Uh, as far as like kind of cost and economics, uh, if you'll think about, uh, let's say uh, you can get 17, 1800 trees per acre. You're probably going to lose somewhere around 10% of those that'll be unharvestable. Deer are bad, um, can damage trees um, and, and other issues. But uh, the old rule of thumb was about a dollar a tree per year uh, to get that uh, to harvest. Um, I'm going to say it's probably, I'm going to say a dollar and a quarter now, maybe. It hasn't changed a whole lot. It, it's not changed a ton. I'm going to say that just that seedling cost going up, um, uh, you know, it's going to affect that. So you're looking at a dollar, a dollar and a quarter a tree a year. Um, so ultimately, if you've got an eight to 10 year turnaround, which got some investment up front, um, but uh, you start harvesting in, in year eight through about year 10, you're looking at let's say $15 uh, roughly <coughs> in that tree. Um, and that's including your loss, uh, that 10% loss. If you're doing wholesale, you're going to probably add on a couple bucks per tree in harvest cost. So that kind of gives you a rough estimation of what a break even would be. Um, how much can you buy a tree? Anybody bought a tree lately, a, a live tree? In Charlotte, they're uh, like an eight foot tree is what, 75 or more dollars? I did buy 
Yep, he said she has 1,500 marketable, marketable <coughs> trees on the nature. And you can get 20 bucks, $20 more uh, wholesale. That may be a little bit, maybe a little bit on the high side, but let's say you can grow them for 15, thereabouts, you can sell them for um, about $35, 37. You know, that's, that's roughly about $30,000 per acre on those trees. Now, again, what I would say, you know, labor's a big issue. If you don't want to have that labor cost and you want to maybe cash in a little bit more, certainly uh, you probably want to space them out a little bit more if you're doing choose and cut. But um, you could certainly sell $45 trees retail right out of the field and let the people go out and do do their cutting, okay? And one of the things with that that's a little bit different too is you would want to uh, space out the ages of those trees. So if you had 10 acres to do, you wouldn't plant all 10 acres because you'd only be able to sell them for two or three years. You know, you would want to stagger those plantings, you know, so that you would have those coming in. But I just wanted to throw that out. Um, it's something that I, I just don't see that, um, you know, certainly on the wholesale, there could be uh, a point where that supply and demand off, you know, kind of gets out of balance again. Um, but as far as the local demand, right now there's just nobody doing choose and cut to speak to. So I, I sure think that's an opportunity uh, for uh, the right situation. And I'd be happy to talk to anybody about that. Um, just think it's a unique, uh, a unique opportunity in this area that's utilized the attributes of a natural native species that we can grow very well. Uh, ideally, you know, 3,000 feet and above is where Fraser prefers. is Joe Lehman. I'm with the Virginia Department of Forestry and I am with uh, Forest Utilization and Marketing over in Charlottesville. I live in the valley down here at Woodstock um, and I used to be the forester in Shenandoah County for well a long time let's put it that way uh, but um, about four years ago we started an urban wood program and the purpose of the urban wood program is to assist small landowners and also people who live in municipalities do something better with their wood than just chunk it up into firewood or have it chipped and sent to the landfill or whatever and so we started this program really all across the state and and the goal is is when you have to take down a tree or you have storm damage on the farm and you've got five trees you don't have to necessarily cut it all into firewood. There's other opportunities. And so that is what today is partly all about. And um, we brought in today Jeff Tidd and his wife, Carolyn, and they're with Tidd's Timber Works of Fort Valley, which is in Shenandoah County. Um, saw milling, you know, is the key, of course, to doing something with your tree. It's, it's really the first. As he said, my name is Jeff Tidd. You can see from my shirt where my story began. We're from, we, we, both of us can wear this sweatshirt. We're both from upstate New York, right here on the Vermont border. So, uh, short of the benches for display and stuff, this is what I typically roll up with when I get called to go out to somebody's house. I don't have, I don't show up with a big loader. I don't show up with, uh, you know, a big crew of people. It's just me, my truck, and the sawmill. And uh, so, uh, typical setup, I have the chainsaw because you never know if the you know, customers don't have a chainsaw. They just want, they, they really don't know what they want a lot of times. Uh, they think they're gonna get their wood and, and start using it the next day. They don't realize that they have to kiln dry it. They'll have to, you know, don't realize how much wood they're gonna get. They want a table. Well, they want a three inch table out of a 48 inch tree. What are you gonna do with the rest of that wood? And they're not, you know, so I, I, I don't mind talking to them and educating them and stuff like that. So I show up with all this equipment. 
Uh, over here is called a capstan winch. And that's on a rope and it goes down and you see it's set up with a log. So sometimes I have to drag a log to get it to the mill because they're heavy. I can't pick them up. And uh, so I hook that up and I'll drag it out of the woods or wherever to wherever it's gotta go. Uh, I have cat hooks over here, but fortunately this is my second mill and it has all kinds of hydraulics. So, uh, so actually once I get it to the mill, the mill does everything. You know, it loads it and gets it up there. So the good thing about the calf stand winch is that it can go anywhere as far as the length of the rope. So I don't have to use that whole length. It just wraps around here and just rolls and pulls it back through. The, the nose on the front of that keeps, keeps it from digging into the ground. And it also, if I gotta go around an obstacle like another tree or something like that, it can actually bring it around. There is a, you know, when I'm milling, the only part of the blade is exposed is right here, okay? And when that's actually in the log, there's even less of the blade exposed, okay? So there's not a lot of damage. The sawdust basically goes out through and out through this little chute. However, I do have a, a uh, it's called a deep arcer. And there's a blade that spins around right in front of here. It basically goes in front and cuts all the bark or any debris off there and it helps the blade last longer. So that particular thing does spin around. It will be on this side and most everything will be shot over here.
We're still on, right? Okay. Okay, so when I cut the first few few cords, I cut, I cut one inch thick, and I'm going to put those back on, and I'll cut the one inch by one inch thickers that'll go in between the boards. The other boards I started cutting, they wanted, the customer wanted them five quarter inch, which is basically an inch and a quarter. So I've started cutting them. I've got a log scale set up on here, and I also have the computer here, so every time I hit this button down, it actually goes down, uh, well, it says an inch and three eighths goes down, but that allows for a one eighth inch kerf. So the final cut for each board is going to be an inch and a quarter and all the way down to the very last board down there. So once I cut all the way down through, I'll rotate them back up on upright, secure them, and I'll cut them as wide as I can get them or if they, you know, because they haven't specified how wide they want it. So. Uh, right now, I can easily cut 10 inch wide boards for them. So they'll have an inch and a quarter by 10 inch wide boards, which is a whole lot different from what you get at Home Depot or Lowe's. If you want a 10 inch board, you're basically getting a nine and three quarter inch wide because they finished by, by planing it. They're, this is rough cut. So we're going to talk about roads here, and, and roads is a really important part of forest management because it's going to get access to, to parts of your forest that need, need work done. Whether it's a timber harvest or wildlife management, you know, you need access in there. So I, this was a brand new road construction here, and it's not yet finished. So. Um, like I say, we got this thing in here and it's been raining ever since that. So uh, we're trying to, trying to get this rain to settle down. And what I'm doing here, this is about a 600 foot section of road here. The original road goes out this way. That's what we're going to uh, travel on. And you'll see that it goes right alongside a great big uh, gully. And I'm trying to avoid an environmental disaster in the years to come because I have culverts in there that are failing um, and, and, and the whole thing is, is liable to just be become a, 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 a catastrophe with the next hurricane. The whole road could just kind of go away. We're good today. It's not going to go away today. So don't worry about falling down in the gully. But um, it was my idea to, to go ahead and avoid that and bypass it. And I wanted to do that starting 10 years ago. So 10 years ago, I had a logger in here cutting on an adjacent stand and I had him cut this car door out 10 years ago and so this year finally I said well maybe it's time that we start building this road so we took a bulldozer we pushed all the material uh, 10 year old material off to the side and it was 10 year old stuff so it was fairly small most of the uh, stumps that were in there from 10 years ago were rotten and easy to push away with a bulldozer so you know Ten years prior, I was planning to do this, and I think it made it a lot easier to, to get it done because I had all that time to, to plan this out, ten years. So uh, we, we got it all cleared out. You'll see up here that we have a motor grader um, from, from Army Surplus, so mm -hmm. it's not a new motor grader, but it runs new because the Army used it about ten hours or so, and then they put it on their surplus. And we were uh, uh, lucky enough to get a hold of that. So we got we got the road shaped up. We got ditches in there, and uh, I wanted to put a, a good base down in here. So we uh, we've got this recycled concrete. This is the equivalent of what gravel would be, not like number threes. And uh, over top of this, we're we're going to put something finer, either a crusher run or a rock called 57, which is smaller. Um, because the horse people will not like this. They don't like their horses running, walking over this kind of stuff. And not that I'm catering to the horse people, but I don't like to drive trucks over this stuff either because the recycled concrete, the bigger stuff here, sometimes will have metal in it. So each time we, we dump a load in here, we have to walk back and forth, sometimes with metal detectors, and try and find some of the metal that's in here so it don't puncture tires. So there, there is 
some there's all kinds of stuff that comes with this uh, comes with this recycled concrete you know <laughs> they come out of buildings and it just gets uh, you know crushed up in a big crusher and uh, and you can there's all kinds of stuff that you find in here so that's the whole idea is is to get a nice firm base in here and then put something a little bit finer to, to top it off with I still need to probably put a culvert in here, right here. I was hoping to get away with not putting a culvert in here, but nature has a way of showing me that um, my plans were not correct. <laughs> so so that, that water piling up in here, I wanna get rid of that, because that's just gonna make the whole road soft it, with the water just sitting where, there. Where would that naturally drain to? It would, it would drain down in here, and uh, uh, it probably go down the edge of this road uh, until, you know, there's probably not a, a big watershed up in here. So I, I don't need a great big culvert, just something to get the water out of the ditch here and go in, in here. And it'll probably just filter into the ground within 50 or 100 feet or so. So when they open down at the other end? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Keep it open. yeah. It'll probably go down the edge of the road until it gets to a culvert down there, which I don't really expect is going to be doing much 10 years from now. So I would expect this road to this, this water here to just sort of filter down uh, into the ground before it ever empties anywhere. It's not really a, a stream, you know, there's not enough volume in here to create a steady flow of water. So that's the whole idea. With, with road construction, water is the enemy. You want to get water off of your road. So you'll see in several other places as we drive along here, there's turnout ditches that take water at, off of the ditches. It collects in the ditches on the side of the road for a period of time, and then and then you pull it out and, and let it drain into the woods somewhere. You have to have topography to do that. So sometimes you get a road that's entrenched, and you have to wait until it comes out of that, that dug-in area to be able to drain the water off. But access into the forest is an important part of forest management. And so I figured we'd stop here and just talk about forest roads and construction of them we're we're lucky enough to have equipment enough to to be able to do most of the work ourselves we have a dump truck and a motor grader and and bulldozer and stuff like that but but uh, you know if you can if you can plan far enough ahead it makes it a lot easier and less expensive to get that stuff done so are there any questions why did you choose the whip how did I choose the width? Yeah. So you'll notice that the width is a little wider than what you might expect. I want to have enough sunlight on this road to keep it dry. And I know that it's not going to stay this wide. It's, it's eventually going to start growing in from the sides. So I want to get a good start um, here and have a good wide road. My colleague who was on the motor grader looked at this and said, why did you make this so wide? <laughs> but uh, but I, want it, I want it wide so I can get as much sunlight on this and keep as much sunlight on this as possible. It's a little bit wider than what you see here, but you know the, the edges tend to grow in. And after 10 years, 15 years, those edges start to sneak in on you and, and it happens very easily. If anybody here is a farmer, you know your farm fields uh, they, they, they tend to creep up on you, those edges, and, and it's always a fight. What, what do you do to, to keep keep the edge in? I've, I've been looking uh, into some kind of equipment where you can, I mean, I can, my bat wing wood pile can go up about five, four or five feet. So I've, I've looking for something you could put on a front end row that you can slow down and trim. They have something called sidearm bush yeah. off that is on an arm, and we have one in the state forest that we share across the whole state. So uh, it stays up at Buckingham um, County most of the time, but we we are able to get it down here, you know, a, a one month out of the year, and it and it's it's an arm, the knuckle, knuckle boom arm, and it'll it'll put the the bush hog up vertical right up against the, the, the trees. Is and it ro uh, like a rotary blade? It's a rotary blade, yeah, but it's super heavy duty, and it'll cut stuff. Uh, and it goes on the back, three point hitch. It, it, yeah, it, it's 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 sort of side mounted, uh -huh. um, so um, it's 
you can get, I've seen them as a three point hitch, but they're not as heavy duty. Okay. Um, and if you get one of these things, it needs to be heavy duty. Uh, you know, you, you got to spend the money. You get what you pay for, as they say. So um, it's, it's side mounted and you need a, a tractor that's probably a, at least 100 horsepower to handle that. Right. Is that, is that what, what, what brand would that be if you Google it? The, uh, we have it on a John Deere tractor and the brand is called Alamo. I think it's called uh, Machete. Okay. Pretty sure it's the Alamo brand. But there's probably all different kinds of plants. Sidearm bush hog. Sidearm. If you Google sidearm bush hog, I'm sure you'll, you'll come up with a thing. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? I have one. Yep. Um, is it too much water? Like, could you put a couple water bars and divert the water up the road? You know, to prevent having a culvert. Um, I mean, I've even seen swales, you know, to allow it to go across that it may be too much water. Yeah, I think that the, that that is a possibility. Mm -hmm. But this water here is coming from over here, and well, uh, that's what I mean to put water bars up there so it would never come here. Right. So I mean, that's a possibility. But from from what I could come up with. Given the topography that we got right here, can y'all hear me back here? So it still goes uphill just a little bit on this side of the road. Mm -hmm. So I, there's no way I can bring the water off of that. Mm -hmm. And I'd rather not come across yeah, no. the road with the water because really um, it, I'm, I'm sort of at the, at the top of the rise here. Mm -hmm. And so there's, there's no way to, to bring the water off except probably 300 feet up. Uh, so I got 300 feet of water accumulating here, which is probably more than I want. Uh, but water bars do, do work. I don't really like water bars in a road that's gonna be used by truck traffic all the time because the water bars have to be put sort of at an angle so that it brings that water off. And when a, a truck loaded with uh, logs uh, hits a water bar, you know, it sort of rocks back and forth. So I want to avoid water bars. And, and in, a, in a road like that, you can use water bars, but we would call them broad-based dips. They're just a water bar that's spaced out, uh, that's widened out, so that, so that you uh, kind of lessen that wobbling of the truck. It's, it's got a much bigger base on it and um, a little bit uh, of a narrow focus it's not so not so deep